Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, May 8th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Mississippi courts chose not to intervene in a case where public funds are being allocated to private schools. Then, Mississippi now joins Alabama as another Gulf South state that wasn't able to approve Medicaid expansion this year. It leaves tens of thousands of people in the coverage gap. Plus, a murder mystery nearly 140 years in the making involving a prohibitionist pastor and the owner of a local prison. That's all ahead, and that's in History is Lunch. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The Mississippi Supreme Court has declined to rule on whether a program directing millions of pandemic relief dollars to private schools violates the state's constitution. In 2022, state lawmakers allocated roughly $10 million from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act to fund infrastructure improvements at private schools across the state. A lawsuit was filed against this spending. Section 208 of the state constitution prohibits taxpayer dollars from being spent on non-public education. Education. Attorney Rob McDuff with the Mississippi Center for Justice speaks with our Mike McEwen about the case. He says the courts have chosen not to hear the firm's arguments on the grounds the federal dollars could have been used for anything, not just education. The Mississippi Supreme Court's decision relied heavily on the fact that the money appropriated came from federal funds that were not earmarked for education that could have been spent on something else. Uh, And therefore, the Supreme Court said that uh, public school parents and public school children uh, weren't injured in any way because the money uh, might have gone to something else if it had not been spent on private schools. But the key fact is that the money was spent on education. And Section 208 of the Mississippi Constitution requires that all money appropriated for purposes of education be sent to public schools, not private schools. And once you, once the legislature violates that provision, they hurt public schools and public school children. Section 208 is based on an understanding that there's only so much money that can be spent on education and that whatever money can be spent on education should go to public schools. Private schools have their own sources of funding, particularly from tuition that they charge to the students. And, and you know, what the, the fact that you take money, whether it's federal money or state money, and give it to private schools – uh, violates that principle and, and you know, hurts, hurts public schools and public school students because you're spending money, you're spending money on education that's not going to the public schools. And, of course, the public schools have been historically underfunded for many, many years. Uh, the, the, the funding required by the uh, Mississippi Adequate Education Formula has never has, has been met only in two of the last 23 years. So this is a, it's particularly important in this day and age to to adhere to uh, the prohibition in Section 208. And we're really disappointed that the Supreme Court sort of dodged the issue by saying that that public school parents uh, and children don't have an interest in this funding issue. So the Mid-South Association for Independent Schools, who was your counterpart in this case, they were essentially asking the court to create special exceptions within Section 208 of the state constitution uh, to bring some of this American Rescue Plan Act money or ARPA money into private schools by ruling that the plaintiffs in this case didn't have standing and thus neglecting to rule on the constitutionality of it, did the court effectively grant them those exceptions? Well, this this is the argument that was made by the state of Mississippi and the Mississippi Attorney General's office, and it was also made by this organization called the Mississippi Association of Independent Schools, which is a private school 
organization. Um, and they, they both argued to the Supreme Court that they should sidestep the issue because public school parents and children can't show any, any injury from the fact that this money went to private schools. Um, and so the Supreme Court ag- agreed with that agreed with that argument and we think it's we think it's unfortunate for, um, you know the money ultimately was spent on education and the Mississippi Constitution says all money spent on education should go to public schools and therefore the, we, we believe it's clear that public school parents and public school uh, students are injured by this sort of appropriation, and we're, we're disappointed the Supreme Court uh, said we did not have a right to bring the case in the first place. In in not ruling on the constitutionality of it, have they effectively granted those exceptions just by kind of sidestepping it? The Mississippi Supreme Court said that public school parents don't have standing to bring this challenge. They didn't say who does have standing, and I think it's really a problem when you have a provision like this that – no one can challenge. Uh, so at least with at least with respect to the use of federal funds, I, you know the Mississippi Supreme Court is letting is is letting this go forward without without enforcing Section 208. Now I think you might have a different issue if it's state funds, and maybe maybe there's someone else who could challenge this appropriation of federal funds, but it, it seemed to me that the Supreme Court basically kind of uh, created a loophole in Section 208 uh, by using the doctrine of standing to say that with respect to federal funds, uh, uh, the public school parents and students couldn't challenge it. So back in early February when the Supreme Court, three-judge panel of the court, heard both sides' arguments – Um, you and your co-counsel, Will Bardwell, spoke of a concern that this might establish a precedent moving forward in Mississippi, wherein, in this case, a $10 million appropriation could in the future be $100 million or $500 million. After this ruling that parents don't have standing, public school parents don't have standing to challenge an appropriation like this, what do you make of that precedent now moving forward? Well, I, I, I certainly think this is a problem with res, at least with respect to federal funding. And of course, so much of so much of Mississippi's Mississippi's um, budget is composed of federal funds. So I think it's it's a big problem that uh, the Supreme Court is holding, at least in this instance, that uh, that public school parents can't challenge it. You know, hopefully the legislature is not going to try to, to to start appropriating larger amounts of money using federal funds to private schools because that really would be an effort to just to drive a huge hole in the dike that was created with Section 208. I and mean, we'll have to see what happens going forward. But I think the Mississippi Supreme Court has created a situation where where the legislature might be tempted to steer more money to private schools than than was ever contemplated by the framers of the Constitution. Robert McDuff is an attorney with the Mississippi Center for Justice and, <clears throat> excuse me, and director of the George Wiley Impact Litigation Initiative. Coming up from the Gulf States newsroom, what does it mean for workers when Mississippi lawmakers choose not to expand Medicaid? This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. Your old vehicle could be your next donation to support Mississippi Public Broadcasting at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. 
State lawmakers recently failed to come to an agreement that would have extended coverage for tens of thousands of working Mississippians. Drew Hawkins of the Gulf States Newsroom reports talks fell apart over disagreements about a work requirement, even though many residents who would qualify actually already have jobs. Thank you for calling the Marketplace. My name is Lakeisha. How can I assist you today? For Lakeisha Preston, every call starts the same. She works at a federal Medicaid call center, and she says many of them sound just like this. Oh, you're needing help about Medicaid coverage? Oh, I can help you with that. Can I have your first and last name? Every day, Preston helps people enroll in Medicaid in other states that have adopted Medicaid expansion, but she doesn't qualify. Preston falls into what's known as the coverage gap. She makes too much for Medicaid, but too little to afford private insurance premiums. So it it really sucks to know that a person in a different state in a higher living wage situation can get Medicaid. Preston is a single mom, and her son, who has ADHD, is on Medicaid. So his medicine is covered. But she has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and hers isn't. I can die at any minute if I don't have my medication. The coverage offered by her job comes with a $2,500 deductible. And she says that cost often keeps her from going to the doctor. I, I might as well not have it. Or I might as well just pay out of pocket for something else. Preston is not alone. Some studies have found that upwards of 70,000 Mississippians are in the coverage gap. And doctors say that can often lead to more serious health problems. I can't tell you the number of patients who I see who come in with advanced disease who have full-time jobs, okay? I mean, plain and simple, that's the coverage gap. Dr. Roderick Givens is the board chair of the Mississippi State Medical Association. The reason they're coming in at advanced disease is what? They haven't seen a physician in years. They can't afford it. Um, They don't have coverage. Given says it's long overdue for Mississippi to expand Medicaid, especially since the federal government would pay for the vast majority of it. It's called the stupidity of politics, period. Mississippi's Republican House Speaker Jason White agrees that politics has gotten in the way of expansion in the past. No denying it's, it's known as Obamacare. Louisiana adopted expansion in 2016, and in Alabama this year, It was talked about in the Republican-led legislature, but it ultimately didn't go anywhere. For a moment, it looked like Mississippi would adopt expansion. White says this time was different because expansion in the red state now has the support of Mississippi's business community. I kidded some of my fellow Republicans. I said, look, come for the savings, if, if you will, and then you can stay for the salvation and the good things that it does to improve people's lives. If you can't get there because it's the right or compassionate thing to do to help these individuals, get there because it makes sense from a business standpoint. But the state's House and Senate couldn't come together on a compromise bill. The main disagreement revolved around work requirements, with many lawmakers saying, if you want Medicaid, you have to get a job. That's just a place that I think you're going to see a, a conservative state come from. But the feds would have had to sign off on a work requirement, something that the Biden administration hasn't done. And ultimately, expansion of Medicaid for anyone in Mississippi fizzled and died in the legislature. So many in the coverage gap, like Lakeisha Preston, who are already working, still can't afford insurance. Yeah, that'll be me. I'm in that situation. A recent report from the Commonwealth Fund, a healthcare research group, was pretty damning for Mississippi. The state's health system performance is in last place, the worst in the country, especially for black people. And it found that increasing coverage, like with Medicaid expansion, is the best way to improve people's health. For the Gulf States Newsroom, I'm Drew Hawkins. The Gulf States Newsroom is a partnership between Mississippi Public Broadcasting and public radio stations in Louisiana and Alabama. Ahead, a murder mystery nearly 140 years in the making involving a pastor and the owner of a local prison. That's coming up in this week's History is Lunch. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. 
What's your favorite type of music? The old standards? Country? A specific type of jazz? Maybe you love classical. In addition to thinking radio reading service, we broadcast MPB Music Radio. Listen live to essential and emerging artists from your HD radio, our app, or from mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. In 1887, a church leader who supported prohibition and a rival local politician who built a mansion called Bellhaven met on Capitol Street in Jackson. After a brief firefight, only one of the men was left standing. But what really happened that day and why did it erupt into violence? Well, that's the subject of today's History is Lunch at the two Mississippi museums in Jackson at noon. Our Kobe Vance speaks with historian and author Ted Onaby about that day and why he's using that as a subject for a book he's writing. I'm looking forward to uh, talking about this topic. It is set in Jackson, so discussing this moment and this issue and the trials about it uh, are exciting for me to, to, to do in Jackson, where you could even step outside the uh, uh, the two Mississippi museums and kind of point to uh, to uh, uh, locations uh, that I'll be uh, describing. Uh, there was a, a shooting uh, that was very well publicized and very um, controversial in Jackson on Capitol Street in 1887. Uh, two men were involved, uh, both prominent white men. One was older, uh, Jones Hamilton. Uh, famous for several things, but most famous for being the the lessee of the penitentiary, the, the state penitentiary, and therefore uh, he had access to and leased uh, the incar- incarcerated men out to the convict lease system. Uh, the other man on the bridge that night was uh, Roderick Gambrell, a much younger man, 21 years old, uh, who was also prominent. Uh, he was the editor of Sword and Shield, which is a prohibition newspaper and Gamble was uh, Roderick Gamble was the, the son of the uh, Joseph B Gamble JB Gamble the editor of the Baptist Record the Southern Baptist publication what i hope people can um, can hear in in the talk is it's a fascinating story that i suspect not many people know and uh, i'll try i'll be trying to do storytelling more than drawing conclusions or making uh, big arguments about the significance although i'm a professional historian and you know, context and significance are part of you know my job. Now I know this is pretty much the core of your talk, but with uh, somebody who's working in the field of law enforcement, I guess corrections, and somebody else who is a prohibitionist and somebody involved in the church, how do those two wind up in a shootout in Jackson? Well, yes, that's that's the interesting topic, and and uh, not not to argue with you, I'm not sure that Jones Hamilton was involved in corrections as much as he was involved in um, penitentiary work that uh, that benefited him and other friends. And uh, the, they ended up on on the bridge uh, with guns, and that's 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 the big issue. Was it planned? Was one of them plan it? Did the other one plan it? Um, was it a conspiracy? Was it an accident? Uh, was it a um, horrible coincidence, which is hard to imagine? But what had happened, excuse me, two things had happened. Roderick Gambrell had written a number of angry columns about Jones Hamilton in 1886 when Jackson had its first local option prohibition election. And uh, Jones Hamilton was, among other things, the head of the Central Anti-Prohibition Club in Jackson, a group that I look forward to introducing to uh, to an audience because I haven't read about them anywhere else. And so Jones Hamilton and the, and Roderick Gamble and his father JB had had been riding against each other in 1886 and 18 and Prohibition won. Prohibition carried in a in a quite controversial election. In 1887, Gamble wrote an editorial criticizing someone who had suggested that Jones Hamilton run once again for state senate, that he uh, had a bad reputation in, among some people for being both in charge of penitentiary and serving in the state senate and serving as an alderman in, in the city of Jackson. And that seemed conflict of interest. And, and uh, Gamble wrote a, 
an editorial um, questioning his character and calling up some of the, the scandals uh, and remembering some of the, the low points from Hamilton's uh, career. And that point was that editorial was so angry, was so insulting that some people feared that Hamilton would go after him, would either ask him to, to meet somewhere as a duel or just send some friends. Um, and so both actually started uh, carrying guns. One night, they happened to meet, or one of them planned to meet. That's the that's the issue. Um, shot each other, and uh, one died. One went uh, had a, a series of, tri- of trials. And the fact that that they were enemies, uh, it was public that uh, they were angry at each other, meant that uh, a lot of people immediately assumed that Hamilton had killed the young man who had insulted him. But it it brought out. A lot of very heated editorial work and friends of each side, and uh, Hamilton referred to Gamble and his perspective as fanaticism and kind of emotional fanaticism. And uh, from the other side, uh, Gamble supporters called him a, a martyr. So what was the community response to this? There were multiple responses, and that's why it's so interesting. The initial response was very widespread belief that uh, Hamilton had shot a young man uh, and had actually formed a conspiracy with four of his uh, friends and employees and had kind of ambushed him on the, uh, the bridge. And the, the bridge there on Capitol Street is just part of why it's so interesting. Is, you know, it's right there. It's, it's a block and a half away from the governor's mansion. It's between the Capitol, the old Capitol and the railroad station. And it's just it's such a public place. But the community reactions were either to condemn Jones Hamilton as saying, you know, this is just one more sign of government corruption, of wealthy people who think they can get away with anything, or the other side uh, saying, you know, we've got to listen to the evidence, don't, li- don't take inspired, moral- inspired moralizing as, as the truth. It filled the pages of Mississippi newspapers. Um, that's, that's part of why it's so interesting. What did it take you to be able to uncover all of this, to be able to find out more details and try to work towards what actually happened that night? I'm working, I've been working for some time on a collection of essays. I'm, you know, I'm a historian, I write books for a living, and, and this es- these essays have to do in one way or another with definitions of innocence, how people uh, why people have to, why people cl- argue that no, they are innocent, whether that's a legal concept or religious concept or, or something else. So Roderick Gambrell saw himself, and people saw him as, you know, this innocent youth, um, kind of martyred uh, by uh, the forces of power. And uh, uh, Jones Hamilton said, "Don't blame me. I shot back in response to the, to an attack." But one of the interesting things I haven't mentioned, and, and thank you for for asking, one of the, uh, Jones Hamilton re- Jones Hamilton didn't just want a verdict of not guilty; he wanted to be vindicated. He wanted friends to say. You're right. You're a good man. You're a responsible person. Uh, so his idea of innocence is, uh, uh, well, there are a lot of them, but his idea of innocence is wrapped up in community approval. And he, he did not like being hated. He didn't like people writing editorials about him as, as a corrupt uh, pro-alcohol murderer. And uh, so, he, so it was really important to him uh, in 1888 to have a book come out that uh, he, he collected all of the letters and telegrams people had sent him to cr- congratulate him uh, when he got out of jail for the not guilty verdict. And he published all of them as a, as a book to say, look, you know, all you people who think that the community opinion is against me, you know, look at all my friends. These are, these are, these are leaders, these people who know me and, and believe in me. So, um, but uh, that's a long answer. The, the short answer is it's a very dramatic story. Ted Onaby is a historian and author. He's speaking at Today's History is Lunch at noon at the two Mississippi museums in Jackson. This has been Mississippi Edition.